Welcome to Business of Design. Business of Design is the world's best business training for interior design professionals like you. The Business of Design podcast offers immediate, actionable strategies and a glimpse into some of the many field-tested, proven systems you can implement to transform your business and your life. After the show, head to businessofdesign.com and get started with the BOD 15-step project management strategy and six foundational programs. Together, they deliver the systems, procedures, and strategies you need to run a successful, highly profitable design business. There's no theory here. The complete BOD business model is yours through Business of Design membership. Business of Design. There's only one. And now, your BOD Advocate-in-Chief, Kimberly Selden. You know that feeling when you suck at something and then you work really hard and you get better at it? Oh, that's the feeling I have around this topic today. We're going to talk about hiring and recruitment and onboarding. If you've ever been in a situation where you need to hire someone and then you run into an acquaintance who says, oh, I know this person, give them a call, you are so disposed to liking that person already because if you're anything like I was when I needed to hire, you're desperate, right? So you just fast track the interview process and you get that person in the office and in a chair and then heartbreak and disappointment, right? According to our guest today, that's one of the best ways to ensure you will not be hiring the right person. Obviously, she doesn't understand how incredibly stressful it is to need an employee or an independent contractor or an assistant or someone to help you because you are just drowning in work, right? So of course, you're going to grab the first live body you get your hands on and no judgment because I have done that more than once. But big shock, it doesn't usually lead to a fulfilling employee-employer relationship. And it costs money to recruit someone, so you want to get this right. I was so bad at the hiring process that I finally hired someone to do my hiring, and then it took us years to develop a hiring process, a multi-layered hiring process. Once we developed our process and it was all buttoned down and in place, I was actually able to enjoy my role in the hiring process. I have a small role in the hiring process because I can't be trusted. I hire anyone who's super fun and I think I'd love to hang out with them and that is really not your best strategy. And in addition to a process for hiring, you also need a process for onboarding that person once you do hire them. One of the best pieces of advice I can give anyone who's thinking about hiring is to figure out what you love and what you loathe. I call it a love it and loathe it list. Write down the tasks you love doing. For me, I love doing all the sourcing. I really love planning the flow and the space plan and getting all of that right. That's really exciting to me. Although I love generically the process of building because I get to see the ideas come to life, I'm no fan of being the project manager, being on site every day and checking in with the trades. So for me, that would go on my loathe it list. Anything you're kind of indifferent toward, put it on the loathe it list. If you don't love doing it, you don't want to do it. When you complete those two lists, it's now really clear what you're excited about and what you do well and who you need to hire. I need to hire someone who can do every single thing on my loathe it list. And I don't need to hire someone who can do the things I love to do. I'm the boss. I get to cherry pick the best parts of the job. That's how it works. Our guest today has a company which is a people's operations company. And one of the things that they do is they recruit and onboard talent for companies. So that's something to think about. I hired someone, it wasn't a whole company, but I hired someone who was really good at hiring. And that was the smartest thing I ever did. You're going to hear from Jessica Harling, who is the founder of Behind the Design. Jessica gets excited about systems and process and training, and she says her company has an intuition for creating strong emotional connections that will help you discover and nurture rock star talent. That sounds pretty good, right? Yes, it does. You can reach out to Jessica at gobehindthedesign.com. That's a little confusing. The company is behind the design, but the website is gobehindthedesign.com, and you can get 
a list of all the services they provide from recruitment and onboarding to leadership and operations development. It's a lively conversation and it's full of quality, tangible advice you can implement right away. But I will do a shout out for Business of Design as well because we do have that multi-step hiring and onboarding process that works. And you know where to find us, businessofdesign.com. That's also, by the way, where you will find the helpful show notes for every episode. So if you heard something great and you're driving in the car, go back to the show notes because we really try to capture the most salient points and make it easy for you to implement the good ideas you hear on the show. We're going to check in with Cheryl Horn. I know one thing she's going to tell us. We have three days scheduled for BOD 15, where you can learn the Business of Design 15-step project management strategy in an intimate setting where you can ask your questions. And one of those cities is sold out. So Santa Monica is now sold out. There are still seats available for Toronto and Winchester, which is in the DC area. So grab your spot. And let me show you how everything you hear on the podcast can be put into a streamlined process that is going to make your clients happier, it's going to make you happier, it's going to generate more profit, and it's going to generate more success than you've ever dreamed of. Give us a try. If you've never done an experience or a class with Business of Design, go to the website. You're going to find so many testimonials. I know we can help you improve your business and get where you want to go. That's right, Cheryl. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. And as you mentioned, uh, these are going to be small, intimate groups, which is why Santa Monica uh, sold out so quickly. But we do have the two other locations available, Toronto on October 4th and 5th, and then Winchester on October 25th and 26th. The reason we are being so strict with keeping these numbers small is that they're very intense days. And if we had 50 people in the room, uh, you're not going to get all your questions answered. So that is a priority for these days. We want to make sure that when you come, you're not only learning the systems, but any questions that you have in order to implement the the BOD 15, we want to make sure that every single person in that room has the opportunity to ask those questions. You know, this is prime time one-on-one coaching uh, with Kimberly. And as well, it's events like these that quite often lead uh, to new boss members, just like our retreat. Uh, we really do get to know Uh, new members as well as longtime existing members who attend these type of events. So I will do a shout out for that as well. BOD Boss, we are accepting applications on an ongoing basis to create new groups as well as onboard members to existing groups. So it is an ongoing process and uh, quite often we meet amazing candidates at these events. You know, I've talked to quite a few uh, podcast listeners and, and Uh, designers from our community who are asking questions about attending these seminars. And I really am emphasizing, don't wait until September. If we, you know, we won't have open registration right up until day of the event. When we hit our numbers, uh, we will close registration. So uh, if you're interested, check out the details and please do register as soon as possible. We do also have early bird pricing until July 31st, because that's sort of our expected timeline to hopefully um, fill these dates. Uh, So check that out on the website. Again, Toronto and Winchester, all dates are in October still. Details are on the website. And of course, you can reach out to me if you have any questions on this or on um, BOSS, because again, registration or applications rather for that is open as well. So check out the website, uh, get in touch with me if you've got questions, and hopefully we'll see you at uh, one of these events soon. Thanks so much. Jessica, nice to see you. Nice to see you too. I'm excited to, to have a conversation today. Well, and in a conversation that is probably going to be helpful to a lot of people, I think, because when you finally get to the point where you decide, finally, at last, I'm going to hire someone to help me, there's a whole process that needs to happen in order to recruit that right person for the job. And that's what we're going to talk about, how to effectively recruit the staff you need. Yeah, absolutely. It is so important that you follow a process um, so that you get the right person and, you know, you're confident in your selection. 
how how are we um i guess i would say how are we shooting ourselves in the foot in terms of recruiting what are the some of the things that people just automatically do that maybe aren't the best practice so the biggest thing i see especially with um smaller businesses and designers is that they rush the process um and take shortcuts and while you can go quickly in the process, um, what I see the most is, you know, they had a friend that suggested someone and they kind of blindly hire them or they have like a 15 minute conversation and they're like, yeah, I like your personality. Come on board. And then, you know, they don't have the skills or there's a culture problem or, or whatever. Um, and they, you know, are losing money because of that then. I totally know how that happens because you're, by the time you need to hire someone, you're usually overwhelmed. You needed actually to hire them three months ago to get them on board for this moment, but it's too late for that. And I was guilty for many years of just hiring the person I liked. They came in the door and I'm like, she's awesome. And they're like, you like her because she's like you. We don't need (laughs) another big personality like you. We need someone to do blah, blah, blah. But I kept hiring the same person over and over again and failing so miserably at that job. It's yeah. not easy, right? It's not an easy task to do. No, and there is um, strategy. There's process behind it, but you're totally right. You know, that's the other thing. They wait to the last minute, and then that's why it becomes rushed. You know, recruiting, well, any process, as you know, needs to be pre-planned. You know, you can't just wing a process. Um, it has to, you know, have a, a system in place, and then you got to follow it to make sure that you get consistent results. Right. And you, and, and the other thing, I guess I would say, we'll get the the negative stuff out of the way and then you'll tell us the positive stuff we're supposed to do. But the other thing I would say is people, once they recruit the job, they think the job is done. When in fact, then you have to actually onboard that person into a process or lack of process, even worse. And to me, that's when things really kind of hit the rails and get, you know, turned dark. (laughs) Back to the recruiting process we go. So, so tell us what, where do we start when it comes time to recruiting? So it actually starts with the preparation. Um, I firmly believe that you have to know exactly what you're looking for. And not just, I need a designer or junior designer or project manager or whatever. You need to know the skills that is required of that person. What are your deal breakers? You know, what is going to be acceptable in terms of culture in your company and really line list those things out. You know, and if you're looking at, yourself or another role, you know, it it might be looking to, you know, others that have been in the position before, see what their successes have been, and then highlight those, write those down. But if you don't have a list, you know, that is almost a job description or a checklist of those um, variables that you absolutely require for your business, then you're you're starting the process um, behind. Yeah, I completely know what that feels like and what that looks like because I did it like that for so long. I re- I resisted writing a job description because I wasn't really sure what I wanted the person to do. I wanted the person to be able to help with the design projects and to do some of the sourcing and to do the social media. And maybe that person's going to help me write an operations manual. And of course, that mm-hmm. person who's good at all those things doesn't exist. And so I wasted a lot of time by not getting really specific about here are the tasks I hate doing, Mm -hmm. but must be done. And those are the things I actually want to hire someone for. Yeah, you're totally right because you know, especially as a first time hire for a business, you want them to do everything because you do everything, but it's not realistic when, you know, they, people have certain skill sets. And so, for example, you know, a designer is going to have to be very detailed. They're going to have to be systematic, but they also have to have a personality because part of it is selling to the client, the presentation and, and getting the deal. Whereas someone that might be behind the scenes is a bookkeeper, an office manager, they may be more reserved. They may not have, you know, that same personality that a customer is going to be attracted to, but they need technical skills. They need technology. They need bookkeeping. They need numbers. And those are very different skill sets that you don't want to combine. Otherwise, you're going to get a person that is that jack of all trades and a master of none. And that's not going to help grow your business. 
Right. Do you think sometimes people are, when they're, when you're at the point where you need, really need to hire someone, you actually need to hire two people, maybe two people part-time because you're probably looking for skill sets that aren't part of one person's makeup. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I am a big believer in hiring, um, multiple at the same time. However, what's hard about that is, it being different roles. So if you're hiring a designer and, um, you know, someone in the office and you're starting them on the same day, well, your time is going to be split between the two of them and not focused enough so that they can get the tools and stuff that they need. So I would stagger that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, you, you have to kind of go into the process being open enough that if you find someone that might be better for another role, um, that you can jump on it so that you have that, um, you know, growth in the future. Yeah, that's a good point about staggering them. And another thing that I learned early on is to constantly be looking to hire, even if you're not looking to hire that rather than treating it like a crisis that's about to happen, constantly be receiving resumes. And when you get a one that really seems too good to be true, meet that person and see if maybe there's some way to use them in the interim and to yeah. kind of onboard them in a, in a nice fashion. Yeah, a hundred percent. That proactive approach is really going to do yourself service, especially from a profitability standpoint, because if you are waiting for the last second, or maybe it just the need became a last second need, you're going to spend more money and more time to find that person rather than if you did it proactively and then you're going to benefit, you know, once they start. What are some other things we need to consider if we're going to be proactive? How do we how do we get ourselves into that proactive position? So part of that is um, laying out the recruiting plan. So you know if you are. Um, out and about and you meet someone, you already have to have in place what the steps of the process are going to look like in order to bring them on board. Because even if it is, you know, a a conversation, um, there may be a second conversation. You bring them into the office or you have them meet with someone else or you maybe bring them on a job site for half a day and just to see how they're going to operate. So if you outline your um, recruiting process, that's the, the first way to help get proactive. And some of those highlights is just making sure that there's different questions being asked at each stage, um, which then goes back to the preparation and knowing you what you want um, so that you're asking the right questions um, of that person. I found that I was um, I was terrible at hiring, and it was so bad that I actually hired someone to do my hiring, which is kind of you know now there's people who do that for a living, which totally makes sense because it's a very um, it's, it has a very strategic set of skills. But when we finally hired someone to do the hiring, we captured the process, and so one of the things I dreaded about recruiting was the, those awkward interviews where I didn't really know what to ask. Tell me about your strength. Thanks. What's a weakness? Uh, blah, blah, blah. It didn't help me at all. So now I have very specific questions I ask. And because they're written down, it's not awkward anymore. I just read the page as if, you know, as if it's been planned, which it has. So there's a, there's a lot of benefit to getting your process on paper. Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're right. I mean, those types of questions, even the candidate doesn't want, you know, or if they do want, it's because they're so, um, prepared to answer it that it's going to make them shine. We want to ask them questions that they're not expecting. And then it's really going to get to the meat of whether this person is going to be right in your business. Yeah. Can you think of a question that the candidate's not expecting just, uh, out of your experience? I, I'd love to know, like, that sounds like a great idea. So the biggest thing is the follow-up questions. So let's say, you know, the first question is, you know, what do you want in um, the your goals of joining a company, right? That's a pretty standard, normal question, and the candidate may have an answer. 
Now, the candidate's answer will tend to be, I want growth. That's the buzzword that you want to hear as a business owner, but it's also the buzzword that the candidate knows you want to hear. And so what happens is the conversation stops. They say the right thing, you move on. But we need to dig into that. So, you know, follow-up questions like, well, what type of growth are you looking for? Because there's so many different types. There's financial, there's title, there's responsibility. So if you're digging into the answer, Mm -hmm. then you can get closer to the root of, um, you know, the truth. Oh, I think that that feels that feels smart. It feels like those follow-up questions would be where you kind of, I don't want to say trick, but they sort of let their guard down and kind of answer off the cuff. And that's when you're really going to get to know what somebody's thinking. I remember asking a question like that to someone, and, and I guess I stumbled on a follow-up question. It certainly wasn't strategic, but <laughs> she came forward with, you know, five years from now, she wants to own her own interior design shop and have her own staff. So I'm like, oh, well, this is, I can see that this is a short term. That doesn't necessarily mean you wouldn't hire that person. Maybe that person is going to be driven, but at least you go in eyes wide open, knowing what you're up against. Right. And maybe a great follow up to that, too, because that does come up a lot is, you know, designers are looking to get their experience, especially the the newbies, the ones that come from design school. They need to get in a firm, get their feet wet, but they may have aspirations to have their own company one day, but that might be in 20 years from now. So they say that we can ask, well, what does that timeline look like, you know, in order to get to that goal? Can you paint a picture of what that path is? Mm. And so they may tell you, yeah, in a couple of years, I want to do it. Or in 20, like when I've got all this stuff under my belt, and then you have, you know, a potential great person for the next 20 years versus someone that's going to leave you in just a year. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I I remember um, typically I keep talking about what it was like, but I just was so scarred. I feel like I have PTSD from hiring. Um, (laughs) But I remember the feeling of like, I, you know, can they string a sentence together? Are they, you know, are they dressed or the buttons all buttoned appropriately? Like you're hired. I need someone (laughs) right now. It's so hard for me. It was so hard to be discerning at the point where I really needed someone, you know, someone would give us a couple of bad answers and I go, well, we'll work on that. We'll work on that. But you really can't mm-hmm. ignore those red flags, right? Yeah. A hundred percent. And you had mentioned, you know, that awkwardness of the interview, like when you get someone in person with you, if you have a phone screen or even a virtual before you get in to the in-person, you can weed out a lot of those things mm-hmm. because, you know, that's something that we do on our end is just have that phone conversation just to even say, Hey, we got your resume. And if they pick up and they just can't communicate, okay, we'll, we'll look at your resume and we'll get back to you. And then we know immediately we don't have to set them up for anything else you know right. and it's hard for people to stay consistent from step to step so that's the other thing if you're just having one interview one phone call and then we're hired then you're not seeing the consistency between the steps and a lot of people drop you know they've got a good first impression they're planned and prepared, but can they actually sustain that long term is the question. And that's what we're trying to figure out in the interview process. So if you have two or three steps that lead up to the offer, you can see their consistency. Are they answering in the same way? Are they showing up on time every single time? Are they dressed appropriately every single time? And that's going to give you a better look at their, you know, long term consistency. Oh, yeah, really good point. We always have them fill out a written um, application first, and it's shocking how many people get weeded out right there. Yeah. They don't answer the question, or they answer it with sloppy grammar, no punctuation. And I'm like, I can't put you in front of a client when you this is your communication style, or I can't even let you talk to a supplier if this is your communication style, because your, your sloppy communication is going to cost us money in the long run. So that's a first step toward weeding people out. Something you said too, I thought was so smart. You said, invite them to a job for the day, because then you kind of have to, or half a day, you, they would have to keep up their persona and be mm-hmm. consistent for an entire day. That reminds me of, I, we go on bike trips every year and we we'll often go with a company called um, Backroads or Butterfield and Robinson. And both of them, when they're hiring new recruits 
one of the stages of the hiring process is a big party, big cocktail mm-hmm. party with lots of people. And that they said that they learned so much about candidates at that party because everybody loosens up after a couple of glasses of wine yeah. and that but a lot of people don't make it past that point because you can you 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 begin to see the true character come out at that point. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny how much you learn in the car. You know, if you're driving with them to the customer's home, for whatever reason, that environment ends up being a little bit more casual than a buttoned up interview in the office. And it's even better if you have someone on staff, um, you know, if you have a, a mid to large size firm, send them with someone else and you'll get a totally different view than you as the owner, the manager, um, because they are completely opening up and you get a totally different look. I think that's great advice. You're so right about that. What what are um, I'm not sure if we covered all the steps in terms of being proactive, did we? I sort of we sort of got excited talking about other things. <laughs> Um, well, from a, a recruiting process, like the sequence of events um, would be your resume screen, then the phone screen or virtual, um, then an in-person, and then your shadow or your test, um, because you want them engaged with you. You know, if you put too many tests up front where you haven't even met them yet, um, candidates often will shy away. You know, it's a, it's kind of a new world in recruiting today um, where candidates do have a lot more power in the process and a lot more options. And so making sure that all of the heavy lifting, like if you're going to have them do a design project just to see how they put together a mood board or, um, you know, if you want them to write a letter of intent or or something like that, that's going to show their skills. Those should happen later in the process, more in that after interview shadow place, then you can, you know, get them engaged, get them excited, and then potentially make that offer. So having that plan laid out will keep you proactive. And then having a process or a checklist of onboarding, you know, once you've made your offer and then you say, okay, you know, between the two weeks that we're preparing, what do we need to prepare? That is a really important thing. So when they start on day one, you already have what they need and their tools ready to go. Mm -hmm. Where we we get ourselves into this position where we're being proactive, we're being discerning, we're using other people, perhaps in the company or somebody else to qual- qualify the candidate to spend a little time with them and see if they act a little bit differently with that person than they do with the boss. Mm-hmm. Let's say um, you you mentioned that th- it's a market right now that's hot for the candidates, that they have a lot of options. What are the things we can do as an employer to make our offer seem attractive beyond offering more money? Because that's I think that's a temptation. I've overpaid paid and gotten really bad candidates before. So I don't think that's always the best way to incentivize someone. Mm -hmm. Um, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's so many studies and statistics done that candidates don't solely make their decision based on money. It is a factor. It's something that they want to better their lives on. But um, money, as we know, doesn't buy us happiness. So having culture, um, good culture, good benefits, those are all important factors. But I also, in the recruiting process, you know, t- try to ask the candidate what they need so I know how to sell them on my business. And a, a lot of this, you know, interviewing process and stuff is like a design sales um appointments where you have to get the information from the customer to try to figure out what they want. And then you can strategize and give them, you know, that perfect thing, not just be an order taker, you know, as a designer. And so if we flip that with recruiting, same thing, we're not just being an order taker for our candidates. We need to dig in and we need to ask them why, you know, what would make you make the decision to join our company versus someone else? And maybe they say money and then, you know, you have to have a competitive salary 
But they could also say at my last job, you know, my boss was a nightmare and, you know, I, I couldn't handle just the um, the negativity in the office. Well, then you're going to be selling the fact that your, you know, office may be really positive. <laughs> so right, right. Um, you got to be realistic in what you're offering and don't oversell them. But if we ask them the right questions in the first screen, then we can know what they're looking for to join a company and we can sell them on that. That to- that makes sense to me. I um, remember candidates being really excited about the fact that we had um, holiday hours in advance. We knew mm-hmm. what the holidays were, and because our office was in Toronto, and we, you know, winter is such a bummer. We we know that summertime and good weather is important to everybody. So we had several. We had three Fridays, I think, back in the day, June, July, and August, an extra Friday off, and awesome. that was a big selling feature. So if you can afford to up their salary, but you can give a few Fridays in the summer off, maybe that's a good way to tempt them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it might just be even things like that your team might be taken for granted. The the things of like every month you do a potluck or you allow your team to wear jeans, you know, it's little things like that, that candidates are like, Ooh, that's a nice perk. So do a a scrape of your business and see like fresh eyes, even even ask your team, what is attractive about this company? You know, if you can get a list from them, that is what you can sell to your candidates. Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. All right. So, um, Bad news, it's a candidate's market right now, (laughs) right? Good news, it's just more incentive for you to become proactive and get a hiring process in place or hire a company to take that off your plate who's, who's trained in knowing what to look for. Yes, yeah, absolutely. All right, good. We like to end every episode, Jessica, with design intervention, which is just a great piece of business advice you want to leave everybody with. Um, I learned very early on that positive brings positive. Um, I am a huge like power of positivity person that that brings good um, every time putting that that positivity in the universe it comes back to me. So in any way that you approach a conflict, a challenge, um, something that seems impossible, try to flip it on its head. You know, my, my grandpa even taught me because I was an artist in um, grade school, high school and stuff. He said, when you get stuck drawing something, literally turn the paper upside down and try to draw it upside down because it will give you a different perspective and it will allow you to see things you didn't see before when you had such a, a wall in front of you. And I, I did it when he gave me that advice. And it's remarkable. It came out even better better than if I just sat there and try to push through it. So change your environment, keep it positive, find that silver lining because there always is one, you know, if you're looking. I love that your grandpa gave you that advice. Maybe that would have helped with my drawing. I'm terrible at drawing. I'm just absolutely (laughs) terrible. I love drafting and I I love the precision of drafting and all of that. I'm very excited and I love the planning, but I can't draw. (laughs) I try to draw upside down now. Jessica, thank you. Thank you so much. It was great to meet you. Thank you. So nice to meet you too. Thanks for listening and supporting the BOD mission to improve the industry one design business at a time. If you're ready to implement an exact business model for running a streamlined, profitable business, field tested by thousands of design professionals around the world, head to businessofdesign.com and get started today. It's time to dramatically improve your business and transform your life.